This video will be on what happens during pregnancy. We'll start from the beginning. So if you release your egg from your ovary, it'll start to travel down the uterus. Now, a lot of the times sperm will meet a halfway and it'll fertilize in the tube. In particular, the ampulla part of the tube or the ampullary part of the, of the tube. So we'll just say ampullary part of the tube. That's where a lot of the fertilization takes place. That's also where a lot of ectopics take place. That's not a coincidence. So we'll say it's now fertilized. And in the tube, it'll start to beat down towards the uterus. But it doesn't waste any time. As soon as it's fertilized, it'll start to divide. So one cell turns into two, turns into four, et cetera, et cetera, as it's traveling down the tube towards the uterus. It doesn't waste any time, it starts dividing right away. It'll keep dividing two to four, four to eight, etc., until it becomes a cluster of cells called a marula. So this cluster of cells called a marula. Keep on traveling towards the uterus until it becomes a blastocyst. In a blastocyst, the cells not only have they started to divide, but they also started to differentiate into cells down here called the inner cellular mass or ICM and then on the cells on the outside called the trophoblast. And those two things, the trophoblast and the ICM, make up your blastocyst. At around day six, I'll say day six, your blastocyst will stick to the uterus and implant. Day six, implantation. Or you can just think of day six sticks to the uterus. So six and sticks sound alike. What happens next? Well, the ICM part of your blastocyst will become the embryo. The trophoblast will eventually become the placenta. Let's just follow this part, the ICM becoming the embryo for now. So this is day six, week one is implanted. Well, it'll start to grow and after week two, the ICM becomes a bilaminar disc. It's turned itself into two sheets of cells. You can think of it as week two, two layers. So week two, two layers. And those two layers of cells, one of them is called the epiblast. That will become your embryo, E for epi, E for embryo. And the second layer is called your hypoblast, which makes things to support your embryo, like your yolk sac. We're gonna follow the epiblast because we're following the embryo for now. The epiblast will continue to grow and on week three, that epiblast becomes three layers. So week three, three for week three, and three for three layers. Three layers. These are gonna be your ectoderm, mesoderm, and your endoderm. Ultimately become your embryo. Some key points in development that you should know is that from week three to eight, your embryo is growing, its organs is growing, its limbs, so it is very susceptible to teratogens. We'll say teratogens. At around week four, that's when your heart starts to beat. So heartbeat. And also your neuro tube. Know this well. I've been asked a few questions about when a neuro tube closes. At around week eight, you can see movement on ultrasound. Week 10, sexual characteristics start to develop so you can find out the sex of the baby. Those are just some landmark times that you should be aware of. That is what happens to your intercellular mass. 
that becomes the bilaminar disc, which eventually becomes three layers, your endoderm, ectoderm, mesoderm, etc., and becomes your embryo. That's your intercellular mass. Let's now move on to the trophoblast, the outside layer, the cell that's going to become your placenta. It's put on the outside because it will eventually need to infiltrate the endometrium, invade the endometrium, and look for blood supply. So it'll start to grow these villi. And the inside layer we call the cytotrophoblast. And the outside layer of the villi we call your syncytial trophoblast. Be aware that the syncytial trophoblast is the first layer that comes in contact with the blood. So it grows these villi, look for pools of maternal blood. And your syncytial trophoblast is the first layer that hits that blood. Because it's the first layer to hit that blood, it can also release hormones to help the baby along. I'll give you an example. The placenta and the baby will release something called human placental lactogen hormone. That increases your maternal insulin resistance. Which kind of gives you like a like a pseudo diabetes. Uh, it makes more blood sugar into your blood, that way your baby can take it up. This is thought to increase insulin resistance so much that it can cause diabetes. But, but during pregnancy, we have a special name for it. It's called gestational diabetes, or just GDM. Very common, needs to be well controlled, otherwise you can have a lot of complications to your baby. So that's human placental lactogen, but maybe the most common or the most well-known hormone that your syncytial trophoblast can produce is beta HCG or human chorionic gonadotropin. And what that does is that it binds to the LH receptor of your corpus luteum. Tells it not to degenerate just yet. We still need the corpus luteum to produce progesterone to maintain the endometrial lining for us to grow and for us to thrive. So tells the corpus luteum, we still need you. Don't go just yet. This is the hormone that we measure in pregnancy tests. We said it, the blastocyst implants on day six. As soon as it implants, it starts to make these villi, make these hormones, and we can measure it one week or after day six in the blood or if you want to do a urine test to measure this it's a little less sensitive so it takes about two weeks before we can measure beta hcg in the urine in urine beyond just measuring it to confirm or deny pregnancy uh, high levels or low levels of beta hcg also um, indicate pathology we're going to talk a little bit more about pathology and pregnancy in our next video, but just know that if the levels are way too high or way too low, then it indicates that there might be something wrong. How does beta-HCG bind to LH receptor? They're not the same hormone. Well, beta-HCG has two subunits. It has an alpha subunit and a beta subunit. Beta subunit is what we measure in, your urine, in our urine test just to see what levels of beta-HCG are there. Alpha subunit, on the other hand, shares is chemically very similar to LH. That's how it binds that receptor. It's also similar to FSH, and more importantly, it's similar to thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH. So levels of high beta HCG can actually cause hyperthyroidism. Important that you know that. That's your intercellular mass making your embryo. That's your trophoblast making your um, villi, eventually your placenta. And we talked a little bit about the hormones it produce. I just want to touch on, I guess, general hormones of pregnancy that's not related to your VLI, but just, I guess, made in pregnancy that you should understand the physio of and why they're made in the first place. For example, prolactin. Prolactin helps milk production. And it also 
blocks GnRH. This is what suppresses your cycle, your menstrual cycle after pregnancy. It's somewhat nature's uh, birth control. Prolactin levels can vary depending on how long you want to breastfeed. If you want to breastfeed longer, you can keep making prolactin, keep suppressing that cycle. It's not 100%, you can still get pregnant, but that's how it reduces the chance of you getting pregnant while you're still taking care of the baby you're having. That's prolactin. Another very similar one is oxytocin. Oxytocin ejects the milk. This is what causes uh, milk to eject from your nipple in the first place. That's oxytocin. Oxytocin also causes uterine contraction. So when you're nearing the end of your pregnancy, it'll start to cause uterine contraction, help you deliver. And then after you deliver, the baby will help you eject the milk. Oxytocin is one of the most widely used drugs in OBGYN because it causes uterine contraction. If we want to induce labor, we give oxytocin. All right, now some pharmacology while we're talking about it, since we're talking about oxytocin, we can give other things that cause labor or induce labor. One of these is dinoprostone, which is a prostaglandin, PGE2. This induces labor, induce labor. It can also be used for medical abortions. So abortions. So we talked about two things that induce labor. Is there something that reduces contractions? So the things that can reduce contractions are going to be your terbutaline or your ritodrine. And both of these are beta to agonists or mimetics. They bind to beta 2 and causes relaxation of the uterus. Relax uterus. One of the most common reasons we give tocolytics is if a mother comes in with premature labor and we want to buy some time to give the mother some corticosteroids, help the baby's lung mature before we deliver. So those are tocolytics. A side effect of these is reflex tachycardia or hypotension. Why is that? Well, Beta-2 mimetics causes relaxation of your smooth muscle, of your uterine muscle, also causes relaxation of your blood vessels. And that can cause um, drop in blood pressure. Your body realizes that and tries to maintain its cardiac output by increasing your heart rate. So you get reflex tacky. That does it for just a physio of pregnancy. Wanted to give a quick review of that before we get into our next video, which is pathology of pregnancy. See you next time.